Welcome to the Law Enforcement Guru, the podcast dedicated to inspire, motivate, educate, and prepare you for a job in law enforcement. Our conversations with industry experts, leading professionals, and on our own personal experience will help you navigate all aspects of the selection process and provide the edge you need to succeed. Now, here's your host with over 30 years of experience, the law enforcement guru himself, Deputy Chief Tony Levitino. Welcome, everyone, to the Law Enforcement Guru Podcast, where we will inspire, motivate, and provide actionable advice on how to survive the application and selection process. Today, we have with us Ken Emerson from 50careers.com, which is a website dedicated to helping veterans obtain law enforcement jobs. Ken is a retired Arizona State Trooper with over 20 years of service. Prior to his job with the Department of Public Safety, Ken also served in the U.S. Army. With his prior military and police experience, he is uniquely qualified to assist veterans and provide free mentoring. Welcome to the podcast, Ken. Thank you, Tony, for having me. So why don't you tell us about yourself and 5 Careers? Sure, absolutely. So I grew up in central New York State. I graduated high school, after which I moved to the state of Arizona. While in Arizona, I decided to join the Army. So I became an infantryman, 11 Bravo, from 1984 to 1988. After getting out of the military, I decided to join the Army Reserves, and that's where I got my first inkling of what it's like to be in law enforcement. During, I was actually attached to a specialized unit. It was a Special Forces unit, the 12th Special Forces Group in Phoenix, Arizona. By no means, I was not a Green Beret. I, was, I never even went to selection. I was assigned to the unit to get ready to go to selection, but I never made it through there, or I didn't make it to the selection process. In the meantime, I was still travel or I was still training with an Operation Detachment Alpha team, and in that team, I met a guy by the name of Sergeant Bob Stelt. Bob Stelt was a sergeant with the Arizona Department of Public Safety, and at one point, he said, "Hey Ken, you know, I think you'd make a really good state trooper. I think you ought to give it a shot. You know, if, if you don't have anything going right now, you know, we're getting ready to start the hiring process. I think it might be a good idea. You know, I think you'd make a really good police officer." Not once, Tony, prior to that, did I ever think of being a police officer. Mm -hmm. I was a private pilot. Um, I worked for the airlines. I was working for Delta Airlines at the time, full time. And when Bob said, hey, you'd make a good state trooper, I got thinking about it. I was like, you know what? You know, that is a good career field. My, My father was a fire police officer. I was a volunteer firefighter at one point in my life um, before joining the military. So after Bob told me, hey, DPS is hiring, I said, you know what? I will give it a shot. I'll go. I'll take the test, see what can happen. Believe it or not, as I was standing in line, it was my understanding at the time they were hiring for 23 positions. When I was in line for that written test, there was over 1,000 people there. And I got thinking to myself, there's no way I'm going to pass this test. I have no idea what I'm doing. But I was told, grab a book do some studying and they have the books out there that you can buy on Amazon, you know, dummies guide to being a police officer, read those books. It definitely helped me with the process. Even talking to individuals in line, they were telling me that they were taking two or three tests at the same time. So I was taking this test in downtown Phoenix. One guy was saying, you know, I'm going to take this test today. A couple of days ago, I took the test for Mesa PD. Tomorrow I'm taking the test for Phoenix PD. Another guy says, I'm just here to see what the test is like. I don't expect to pass. I just want to see what it's like so I can prepare for the next time. Mm-hmm. So in my mind, I was like, I'm here to pass this test. I want to I want to try and do my best, see what it's like, and, and get it done. So I actually took the written test. I scored 91%. Great. To, to get into the academy, you had to be at least a 95 or above. But Ooh. because I was a U.S. military veteran, I had five preference points. So for veterans out there, you get that five preference points. And somewhere in the process, you can have that added to your score. So that took me from 91 to 96% and, made, and it allowed me to move on through the testing process. The, uh, the next test was the physical fitness. I've always been a runner. However, I was having difficult times with my feet at the time. So even if you are mm-hmm. got a little bit of a handicap, and with me, it's always been my feet. Right now, in 2008, 
while I was a bomb technician, member of the SWAT team, I had to have some serious surgery in which I had 11 screws put in my feet, and but it didn't stop me. You know, so if you got physical disabilities, I even tell veterans if you got physical disabilities, as long as you could pass that physical fitness test, you're going to be okay. You're going to be able to be able to do the job. Mm-hmm. The only issue I had going through the process was the oral board exam. So if you did oral board exams in the military, such as a sergeant's test or trying to go for um, soldier of the month kind of test and you're in front of oral boards, it really helps. I was so nervous in the oral board, it felt like I was sitting sideways when I know I was actually sitting straight up and down. In the oral board, I was after I completed the oral board, I got a letter in the mail about two weeks later saying that I did not obtain a passing score. Broke my heart. Couldn't believe it. I was like, ah, I didn't make it this time. But I understood what the other guy, I remember what the other guy said in line saying, you know, you never make it on the first try. Mm-hmm. But about a month later, after I let it all go away, I got a phone call from my roommate saying, hey, DPS is trying to get a hold of you again. So I talked to, I called DPS and they're like, hey, what are you doing? Are you, don't you want to be a police officer anymore? I was like, well, I got this letter in the mail saying I failed the oral board. They're like, no, that was a mistake. You know, <laughs> they had somebody questioned one of the questions in the oral board. And so we had to throw it out and that gave you a passing score. Uh-huh. So do you still want to be a police officer? I'm just like, absolutely. So for the next week, I had to do the uh, a physical exam and then I had to go see a psychologist and on a Friday, they called me and said, you've passed. If you want the job, it's yours. You start the academy on Monday. So, of course, I went to Delta PD, told them, or I went to Delta Airlines and told my boss, I said, look, you know, they're offering me a job on Monday. They're like, you know what? You got a job here anytime you want. Congratulations. Go be a police officer. If it doesn't work out, we'd love to have you back at Delta. And from that day forward, uh, Delta has been my airline the best place to work other than being a police officer. So that Monday I started the police Academy. Excellent. So what was it about your military experience that translated into uh, having the skills to be a police officer? Actually, there's a couple of them. One being infantry, you know, you're constantly on at the time, the M 16s, we didn't transit tra- We've never transitioned to the M four while I was in. So, what really helped me is, you know, for qualifications purposes, you know, shooting the M16 on the rifle ranges. I'm not a combat veteran. I served during the Cold War, so I never got an opportunity. They had Grenada before I got, I got in, and then they had Panama after I got out. Even in the reserves was after the uh, Desert Storm, so I never had any kind of combat experience. But the camaraderie and the training that we did as infantrymen, and it's not just for infantrymen. My son right now is a helicopter repairman in the Army. The, commod- the camaraderie and the working together to keep those Apaches flying, all that mm-hmm. transitions over into you know being a police officer. My brother was in Iraq in 2005, and he was in charge of convoys. At the time, convoys were getting blown up. Those guys driving trucks still translates into being a, a police officer. You're aware of your surroundings. You know, you're driving heavy equipment in a police officer. You're driving, you know, a squad car, possibly at high speeds. Um, so a lot of those things helped me transition into being a good police officer. When you were in the academy, obviously the tactical staff knew that uh, you were a vet also. Did they lean on you a little bit to help out the other kids that weren't in the military? <laughs> they didn't. And I don't think the staff really knew that we were. But I think they could tell because we did do that. You could tell who the veterans were because they were helping other people out to get them through the process. Very. So we had a class of roughly 23 officers, and I believe only two or three didn't make it through the process. And mostly that was for either lying or doing something they shouldn't have done. It wasn't physical fitness. But it was obvious that you could tell who was in the military. A lot of times it was mainly because of haircuts. You know, a lot of people... Mm -hmm. You'd have to have trimmed, but you could tell the military guys because they're getting high and tight, so they're shaving their heads. And and then they're also, the way they're acting hardcore, at the shooting range, how they're holding their rifles, you could tell that the, the uh, firing instructors were really helping out other people 
not the vets because the vets are you know pretty well trained on on how they hold the pistol and and you know and how to shoot already yeah my uh academy experience was the same i went in when i was 20 and we had uh former marine corps uh, officer in there and the tax staff just said hey take these kids out into the parking lot and teach them how to march so i mean they deferred <laughs> all that to them so i mean he was uh, also in the class, but he was also very experienced and got it squared away. And, and I'm sure that any of our listeners that are vets now, if they become police officers, probably the same thing will happen at their academy class. But uh, tell me a little bit more about the, the preference points and how important that is um, specifically for applying to certain agencies. Sure. So actually the way the preference points work is two ways. So if, if you're honorably discharged out of the military, you don't have any physical disabilities or, or military-related disabilities, veterans are allowed five preference points. Agencies have different ways of how they apply it. Some apply it to the written test, like Arizona DPS did for me. Other agencies apply it to the oral board exam or somewhere else in the process. If you have a service-related injury, then you can apply for up to 10 preference points. That'll help you through the process. For me, getting a 91 on the written test, I would have been in the academy behind the, the actual academy that I got into. But because I had five points added to it at that time, that put me in the, the first academy instead of the second academy. So it's really, if you're a veteran and you do apply, it's a federal thing, so you do get those preference points you need to either do some research into the agency that you're looking at applying to, or you need to talk to the recruiter and find out where do those preference points come into play. How about applying their previous service to uh, buying years for their retirement? So a lot of agencies, depending on their retirement system. So Arizona has the PSPRS, which is a public safety personnel retirement system. They allow veterans to purchase your military service time. And you're, again, you're going to have to talk to the recruiter to see how much time you could buy back. So at DPS, we could buy up to four years of your military time. I believe now it's at five years. So what you can do is if you spent four years in the military, the agency that you're applying for has a 25-year retirement uh, cutoff. You could buy up to five years of that time. You could potentially retire at 20 years with full benefits, but it's going to cost a lot of money. And I'll use me as an example. When I got on with DPS, they wouldn't allow me to buy my military time at the beginning of my career. So what I had to do is I, I put money into Nationwide Deferred Compensation Program, and it got to a point where I finally had enough money to buy my time, but it was only two years of my service time instead of four. So... The further along that you go in law enforcement, the closer you get to retirement, the more expensive that service time is to purchase. So when I got to 16 years, if I wanted to buy all four years of my service time, it was going to be close to $104,000. Two years of my service time, I paid $64,000. So that mm -hmm. took me from 16 years at that point to 18 years in the retirement system. And then all I had to do is two more years and I could retire with full benefits. So if you've got an agency that has a 20-year retirement and you have five years of military service time that you want to buy, if you could buy that at the beginning of your career, that's going to be the cheapest time to do it. If you can't, some agencies allow you to make payments to buy that military time. And if you can't do that, a deferred compensation program is a good place to put your money so that it will grow to a point where you can finally buy that time. So if you buy that five year time at 15 years, you can actually retire at 15 years with full benefits as if you retired at 20. So it's, it's an excellent program. I've talked to thousands of veterans, whether or a thousand police officers, firefighters, Department of Corrections officers. Number one goal they want to do is buy their military time. It gives them that option whether they want to retire early or not. That's awesome. Of course, the more years you have in the retirement system, the more your benefits are when you Correct. actually retire. Yeah, exactly. So you could buy that military time. You got 15 years, but your retirement is 20 years and you want to do another five years. You actually do 20 years working, but your retirement's at 25 years. 
instead of getting 50 percent of your pay now you might be getting 66 percent of your pay or 75 percent of your pay whatever it is you know for that particular agency and their their uh, retirement system how about when um a service member leaves the military his options whether he's going to join the reserves or not uh how willing our agencies to accept uh, somebody who's also in the reserves? Very willing. Actually, we had a, a guy I was uh, friends with on the SWAT team. He was a paramedic for our SWAT team, still is. At one point in his life, he said, like, I got to try something different, something a little bit more. He's still a SWAT team paramedic, or actually, I think he's a paramedic on our helicopters. He actually went to warrant officer school and became a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. So in his spare time, that's what he's doing. He's flying helicopters uh, for the Army National Guard in Arizona. And then he's full-time paramedic on our, our Bell helicopters that, that DPS has. The individual that told me, hey, Ken, I think you'd make a great police officer, he spent 25 years as a Green Beret. He actually went through basic training at 30 years old and went through the Green Beret training, the Q course, at 33 years old and was an honor graduate. I was like, unbelievable. I was looking at his plaques. But for me personally, I was 30 years old when I became a police officer. And because of the issues I started having with my feet, I talked to the military. I ended up getting out of the reserves just because I, I really wanted to concentrate on my career as a police officer. Plus, I knew I wouldn't be able to go through the uh, the selection process and the Q course because of the, the, uh, the problems I was having. But for most agencies, from what I understand, because I talked to a lot of people throughout the years that are still in the military, that are that are also uh, police officers. They go hand in hand. I regret one of my regrets is not staying in the military because I could start drawing that retirement in a couple of years at 59 years old and get my retirement from DPS. And I didn't do it. I wish I would have. Yeah, that's a great benefit. I have several friends that stayed in the military, finished out their careers in the reserves, and now are drawing retirement from. Um, the military also. Of course, you know, there was always that chance that you could get activated. And as we know, Correct. after 9-11, many of our police officers that were in the reserves went back active duty. But uh, the good news for all you vets out there is you're not going to lose your job. And in many cases, you're going to draw, you're still going to continue with benefits if not provided for otherwise. So Correct. agencies are yep. very uh, supportive of, of you that if you're staying in the reserves. Yep. And I'd never heard it all, you know, through 9-11, because I, I, I remember right where I was at on that day. I remember a lot of my friends getting activated and leaving. Not once did I hear from fellow police officers, hey, we're being left shorthanded out here on the road. Never happened. Those guys are going out to do an even more dangerous job now, you know, protecting our country. So our department 100 uh, percent supports the, uh, the the troops that when they get activated or if they got to go for a weekend or the two week drill for the for the summer. Yeah, it's never been a problem. So what would you suggest if uh, somebody is in the military right now, how soon should they start seriously preparing for the application and selection process? So getting out of the military from my research, they didn't have the transition assistance program when I was active and getting out in 1988 off of active duty. But I believe they go, they start the process right about nine months prior to getting out. A lot of agencies will allow you to take the test while you're still active duty. So you have to talk to the recruiter, ask them, you know, can you come here or will you send a test or where can I go to take a test? Because I want to be a police officer in your state, even though I might be based in an, in an outside state. Or do I have to wait until I get out and come take the test? So a lot of guys, what they've done is they'll take leave, fly to the agency to where they want to be a police officer, take the test there, and then try and go through the process. A lot of agencies will try and accommodate a soldier knowing that they're taking leave to be there to go through these processes. So sometimes you might have to take a written test one day. Later that afternoon, you're taking a physical fitness test, and then the next day you're taking your physical you know, for these law enforcement agencies. So it's really important to reach out to the recruiter of the agency or agencies that you might be interested in and find out um, what it's going to take to get you into the process. But you can always start no matter where you're at in your military career, how long you got coming out, you can always go ahead and start your research. 
you can start your studying process because a lot of tests across the country are the same. If you go to my website, 50careers.com, you'll actually see a list. Even if you're interested in Texas, I have 700 agencies listed in that state. You might find an agency you never knew existed. So you can highlight those agencies, drop them in a, drop them in a search engine, contact them, ask them, are you hiring right now? Are you not hiring right now? What can I do right now to get the process started? Or what can I study? You know, I want to be a cop at your location. And a good suggestion also would be if you're going there on leave because you're going to go see your family, go do a ride along. Contact the agency and say, hey, can I come do a ride along with you guys? I'm interested in being a police officer after I get out of the military. And this is where I want to be. Always helps. It gets your name out there. It gets it in front of the people that are important, that are going to listen to you. Talk to a recruiter. Do a ride along. Um, some of the things I would suggest you doing. Is there uh, anything specific that you can give as a recommendation to uh, as a, a veteran starts looking at which agency to apply to? There's, there's every agency has different benefits. They have different pay. The pay scale when you're in their academy is, you know, X amount of dollars. When you get uh, graduate the academy, the pay goes up. When you get off for probation, it pay goes up. Certain agencies pay X amount of percentage towards their retirement where the officer pays a certain portion. So of all these thousands of agencies that are on your website, how is somebody supposed to look at all that and assimilate all that information and, and actually pick the right agency? Is it based on like uh, typically they want to go back to their home state or um, do you see that some of them are, are just chasing the money and the benefits? Right. So it's really a personal preference. It's actually what do you want to do you know, when you become a police officer, if, do you want to work for a smaller agency where you're really up and close with with the, the public? You know, you're going door to door, you're walking the streets, you're saying hi to the public. You know, you're really getting down to that community based type policing. You know, some of those small agencies won't have the specialty units like a bomb squad or SWAT team or an aviation section. They're not going to have a governor security detail or anything like that. If that's what you like, you know, you know kudos to you. Do some research. You'll find those agencies on my site. You can highlight those agencies. Take a look to see if they're hiring. If it's not highlighted blue or if they're not highlighted orange, they simply don't have a membership on my site. But you can still click on it, put it in a website, and do some research. If you're a special operations kind of guy and you say, man, I want to be a SWAT team guy, a lot of the, a lot of the smaller agencies and some of the uh, county agencies, they might have multi-agency uh, SWAT teams to where they pick two or three people from each agency through a selection process and they put you in together as a group and you start training as a SWAT team. Other other locations like bigger cities like Phoenix PD, NYPD, Memphis PD, you know, my agency, Department of Public Safety, we had our own SWAT team in which we did a selection process from our own officers. You become a SWAT officer. Um, our agency also had the bomb squad. We had the aviation section. The smaller agencies won't have that. So it's really a personal preference in, in how far you want to take your career or how many different things you would like to do. It's, I mean, with my agency and a lot of agencies, you could do one career. You could be a patrol officer for five years, move over, do a gang unit, be a detective for four or five years, maybe get into homicide for three or four years, get on the SWAT team. Next thing you know, 20 years is up and gone. And you're like, what the heck just happened? You know, mm -hmm. where'd my career go? I just, it goes just that fast. If you'd rather just walk the streets and, and meet the public and be the best police officer, maybe promote up to sergeant, up to lieutenant, captain, on up to process, you know, every agency has that opportunity. So it's really a personal preference when it comes to that. Excellent. Uh, from all the hundreds of entry level interviews that I've done, whenever we've had uh, vets come in, some of them struggle to take their military experience and, and put it into uh, an answer during an entry level or oral. How would you suggest a, um, a vet capitalize on their experience and be able to translate that to an oral board on um, why they'd be a good police officer? Sure. So one piece of advice I'm going to give right now 
And I've sat on quite a few OR boards for the Department of Public Safety for new hires. Please, we love the uniforms. You know, the uniforms look great, but two of the guys sitting on the OR board with me had no idea what the medals mean. If you, What you need to do is reach out. There's some good organizations. I believe um, Joseph A. Banks is one of them. They'll offer discounts on suits. Get a suit if you're going to go into an oral board. Do not wear your Class A uniforms. Don't wear all your medals because, for the most part, they don't know what they mean anyways. You're applying for a job with a civilian organization. You're not, you know, through a military board. You know, I'm a military guy myself. You know, I love my Class A's. Uh, my son's military. I love his Class A's. But the oral board to become a police officer is not that. If you have questions about how to transfer your military experience into a civilian experience. There's quite a few resources out there, including the Transition Assistance Program. Uh, you can talk to individuals there, or you can contact individuals like myself or Tony even and, and ask, you know, look, I'm preparing for an oral board. What's going to help me best get through this? How can I transfer my military experience into being a police officer? And another way you can do that, too, is, is write on a piece of paper. You know, what did you do in the military? Were you a military police officer? That's going to transfer a little bit easier. But if you're a helicopter mechanic or a vehicle mechanic or a tank mechanic or a Bradley gunner, for instance, write down everything that you did, all your responsibilities, maintaining that equipment, um, going through training, team training with your fellow, uh, fellow soldiers. And then on the right side, do research. What exactly do police officers do? You know, we, we don't just work, you know, walk a beat. We're de-escalating uh, really bad situations. We possibly have to use, you know, deadly force in different situations and translate those because I guarantee one question a lot of people get asked on oral boards are, do you think if you have, do you think you would be able to take another person's life or be able to shoot somebody? And you just can't come out and tell the oral board, oh yeah, I could shoot anybody. You know, I, I did that plenty mm -hmm. of times in the military. Mm -hmm. Not the right answer to give. You know, you gotta you gotta realize that you're going from a military to where you're being trained to kill the enemy to where now you're working with the American public. You know, you're doing traffic stops. You're doing you know possibly hostage rescue situations. You're not just busting in and and, and kicking ass and taking names. So it's a good time to to make a list down there that how's what I did in the military going to transition over. And then kind of get an idea of what kind of questions an oral board is going to ask. And that way, you know, you'll be better prepared. Right. I think the best piece of advice is that, yes, you were in the military. You have translatable skills that the agency is looking for. But still, whatever you did in the military will not always translate into your success as a police officer. Just don't assume because you were successful in the military that you're automatically going to be successful in law enforcement. You do end up at the bottom rung of the ladder again. Correct. So just, so, and I've seen countless uh, vets make that that mistake. You know, I was a lieutenant in the military, so I should be a lieutenant in a couple of years at the police agency. It's not necessarily the case. Is that is that what you found? Yeah, it is. You know, actually, a good friend of mine I just talked to the other day, he's a captain in the Coast Guard. But in law enforcement, he's an officer. You know, he's a mm -hmm. paramedic. He's an officer. He's, he's, he's not a sergeant. He's not a captain. He's an officer. But in the uh, in the military, he's a captain, which is, from my understanding, is equivalent to a full bird colonel in the Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he doesn't, you know, he, he he doesn't really he doesn't bring that military experience in, you know, being a captain there over into into DPS. But if you're a specialized trainer in say the Marine Corps is at MARSOC or U.S. Army Green Beret or Navy SEAL and you want to become a police officer because you want to get on the SWAT team, you're going to have to dial it back because they don't go in the same way you do in the military. You're not fragging every room that you're going in. You know, you're going in, you're not there to shoot people and kill people. You're there to arrest people. So that kind of mindset has to change a little bit. But when the teamwork comes together because of all the training that you're doing, then, you know, it really melds together really good. Like I say, the bomb squad I was on, we had two guys were Green Berets. One guy was an airborne 
Another guy was a ranger. I was in the infantry, and a couple of guys were Marines. So, I mean, talk about harassing each other about which branch was better than the other. But when it came down to getting a call somewhere in Arizona to go look at a device, suspected device, or a couple of pipe bombs that we needed to deal with, all our training from law enforcement kicked in together. We're not just going down there, sticking a pond of C4 to that thing and blowing it. You know, we have to do an investigation on this. We've got to see who made it, if we can get fingerprints off it. You know, we got to render it safe, safely, so that we can continue with the investigation. You just can't counter charge it and go home for the day. So it transfers over good. You know, it's a good experience, but you got to do it the civilian way. Exactly. Uh, also, you know, during your law enforcement selection process, you're going to take a psychological interview. So obviously, uh, we send our military personnel into dangerous situations, highly ch emotionally charged, uh, um, and could have a psychological impact on the veterans. So obviously, there's going to be that uh, component during a psychological interview where the psychologist might want to discuss their military experience. Can you give any advice to our veterans on how to handle that? If they've never been through a psychological interview, taking the MMPI, which is a very long multiple choice test. Any advice for veterans? Absolutely. So I actually had a customer, one of my clients, that's his exact question. I have PTSD. You know, will I even make it through the psychological exam? So my advice to him was, you know, what causes your PTSD? You know, is it something that you saw in Iraq or Afghanistan? Was it an explosion of a vehicle to where you saw your buddies, you know, wounded or killed? Or was it maybe some civilians that you saw after you attacked a location, you know, What's causing your PTSD? Because when you become a police officer, and I don't care if it's a if it's a highway patrol officer, if it's a city agency, if it's a county deputy, you're going to see things out on the streets in people's homes that you might have saw in a war zone. So if seeing little kids injured or killed is triggering your PTSD, you got to realize you could end up on an accident scene in which small children are seriously injured and killed. So it's something that you really got to talk to a psychologist about before making that move forward to being a police officer. I mean, you, you, there's house, you know, car fires, you know, after collisions where you see burned bodies. Um, I've seen children, you know, killed in car cr and car crashes. And, uh, and then you got homicides, you know, you got locations where murders have taken place and you're going to be there. You're going to be the first responder. You're going to be the first person there. And if they're still alive, you're going to be the one trying to save their life, you mm -hmm. know? And the last thing you need is, is somebody having an episode because they're being triggered from something that happened in the military. So you have to be careful. It's another personal decision, but it's also curable. I wouldn't say curable, but it's also something that you can talk through with a psychologist and say, look, you know, this is what I want to do, but this is the problems that I have. If you don't think you could do it, you can look at law enforcement. They have hundreds of different jobs, crime scene analysis. They have accident reconstructionists. They have um, people working in the crime labs, even. If, you, if, if maybe PTSD might be an issue, then you'll be a criminalist. You know, you go to college and, and get a degree on your GI Bill and become a criminalist and work in the labs doing DNA tests. You know, there's always a job you know, for a veteran or for anybody else that if they don't make it through the process for whatever reason, or if they have uh, PTSD issues, there's always something else that can be there for you. And, and it's still a great career. Sure. The agency can make reasonable accommodations for you, but your PTSD ultimately still needs to be manageable. And exactly. It needs to be manageable and it absolutely needs to be addressed. And I'm going to say this right now, you know, for those listening, if you are dealing with PTSD, there's a lot of help out there for you. You know, you, you go online and there's hotlines, people that you could talk to. And, you know, I stress that that you do that um, to get that help that you may need. Right. Also, uh, there's going to be a polygraph examination with many agencies. And, you know, we, we you join the military, relatively young age, sent to various parts of the world with different cultures. You may have been involved in something you may not necessarily 
uh, been too proud of, something you may not have done back at in your hometown that might come up during the, the polygraph. Do you have any recommendations for vets when it comes to issues like that and the, the polygraph? Yes, honesty. Honesty. Lying is the number one killer of people losing the job of being a police officer or not getting hired. Everything's going to come out. If you did something as a junior, you know, under, under the age of 18 or something over the age of 18 that could be considered a felony, a lot of agencies, especially nowadays, agencies are having a tough time hiring quality candidates. You need to be honest with the recruiter. You need to be honest with your background investigator because he's going to dig so far back into your into your past and he's going to be talking to a lot of people it's going to come up and if they ask you that same question on the polygraph exam and you lie and they catch you in a lie you're not going to get hired so i'll use an example as a background investigator i I gave the guy the application he didn't you know part of the application asked if he served in the u.s military and he said no when i went interviewed his wife and she said oh yeah when he was in the army I was like, well, wait a minute. You mm-hmm. said he was in the Army? She goes, yeah, for a little bit. I go, well, you put on his application. He was never in the military. So I asked her about it, and he didn't last past the uh, basic training. But still, he lied about it. I had to cut him loose. I had to stop the process right there. I told him, look, I knew he was testing for another agency. I go, go talk to that recruiter right now and tell him, look, I made a mistake. I was in the military. I got released. I got a general discharge. That doesn't keep you from becoming a police officer. And dishonorable discharge will, but a general discharge won't. Because typically, a lot of times, that general discharge will eventually go into an honorable discharge at a later time. So he actually did. He went and called the recruiter, said, look, I made a mistake. I want to change this. I want to talk about this. And he got picked up by that agency. But because he lied to me and I caught him lying to me that that I had to stop the process right there for him. So honesty is always the best process. You're going to be nervous going into the polygraph exam. There's not a soul out there that's not because you don't know what's going to be asked. I actually got a little nervous because at one time in my polygraph exam, they asked me if I ever touched little kids. And the first thing that came to my mind is spanking my son. But for some reason, that registered on the polygraph exam. So they asked me that question again towards the end of the polygraph. And then I really started sweating. But afterwards, we talked about it. I go, I was just thinking about my son and and, and playing with him or spanking him or whatever. And everything was fine. But if there's any questions, and they'll ask you prior to the polygraph, do you have anything you want to say? And they'll get a baseline on you and how you feel. So if you are nervous, they're going to get a baseline on that and they're going to register it on their machine. And then just just stay calm, you know, keep a clear head and and answer truthfully and you're not going to have a problem. Yes, I'll have future episodes where we talk specifically about the polygraph, but basically it measures your physiological response to questions, which uh, ends up with a psychological reaction. Um, And if Listeners want to go to lawenforcementguru.com, click on resources. On the resources page, I have a free download for called Polygraph Preview, where I have some of the questions. Some of the questions are going to seem extremely bizarre, but they're designed to elicit a response from you on some areas where the agency is interested in your background. So like you said, the best response is to be completely 100% accurate. Um, having a misstep or concealing some information potentially could prevent you from getting hired with all agencies. You're the guy in your example, very lucky, but, uh, you know, the tendency is, um, and you were a background investigator. I was a background investigator where that we consider ourselves to be the gatekeepers for the agency and we're trying to prevent hiring the wrong person. Right. And, and, do some research to look at what the requirements are for those agencies. A lot of agencies will say, hey, yeah, you can use marijuana. You know, as long as you didn't use it more than 20 times, you know, you, you're not addicted to it or you're not a habitual user. Be honest with them. If they ask you, if the recruiter asks you, have you ever used marijuana and you have, say, yeah, yeah, I used it four or five times or whatever it is. 
you start saying, yeah, I use it two or 300 times, you know, forget it. You're not going to get in because you're a habitual user. I had an individual that said that uh, part of it was you can use marijuana, but you can never buy it and sell it. And I actually had a guy come to me in his application saying he used to buy bags of marijuana in high school, break them down into smaller baggies and sell them. I'm like, how did this even get to my desk? You know, this, that, that alone, him selling it alone should have been caught by somebody prior to me. And that should have been tossed out. He should have, he should have been told thanks, but no thanks. You know, you used to sell drugs and that's a no go when it comes to hard drugs. I've seen applications now that even allow the use of certain hard drugs as long as it wasn't more than five times. But other certain drugs like um, any kind of hallucinogen, you could pretty much say, you know, you can't get in. If you, if you know, so if you use LSD, you know, you drop an acid, stuff like that, you know, most agencies are afraid that if you hire an individual that's used drugs like that, that you might have some kind of an episode um, while you're working, yeah, some kind of hallucination. So any kind of drugs like that, don't waste a recruiter's time. Don't waste your own time. You know, just find some other line of work. So go to the website. The drug policy is typically listed there. Look Correct. at the listing of the drugs. And if you don't fit within the policy of that agency, don't apply. Because uh, that background investigators, they are pit bulls. And they will find somebody who saw you take something that was that you shouldn't have, if that's the case. Correct. And yep, no reason exactly. to be caught in a lie. I, right. I can t- I can say, you know, we had our in-house uh, polygrapher, and uh, when I was in background investigations, his uh, the polygraph room was directly across from my office. I literally opened up the door, and I'm looking right at the polygraph room with the light on the outside, you know, that's red for in use. And uh, so the applicant would come in and I'd go over their pre-polygraph personnel, uh, pre-polygraph interview uh, questions, which you will be provided. You'll fill them out, yes or no. And if you end up with a yes, there's a space there for you to explain why you answered yes to that question. And I I had flagged in this kid's report um, some drug concerns, you know, but he was adamant that he only smoked marijuana twice while he was in high school. Well, the day of his polygraph, he came in. I had him once again review his pre-poly uh, interview and had him sign it again with the date and asked him if there was any of these questions that he wanted to change. This is his opportunity. He said no, he was good to go. So he went across the, the room with the, the sergeant. The door closed, and about an hour later, that he came. the door opened up and he flew out didn't even stop in to say goodbye to me and went flying by my my office and uh, and he went out the front door and uh, the sergeant came out laughing. And, you know, he's like, well, you told me this kid only used marijuana twice in high school. Well, by the time I was done with him, he'd, he'd used it, he dealt it, he distributed it. And that's not just the only drug. And he went down, he was doing heroin, he was doing cocaine, et cetera. So, you know, chances are I'd probably find that out as a result of doing the background investigation if he did manage to pass it. But, you know, be honest. Um, Take a look at the drugs. If you don't qualify, don't do it. Uh, What about uh, anything else vets just specifically should know during a background investigation? Is there any specific military records that they should gather up before they apply to provide to the background investigator? Not only the background investigation, you're going to need your DD-214 to prove to the department that you do have an honorable or a general discharge in order to get to five or ten preference points. So make sure you have a good a copy or two copies of the DD-214. You may have to leave a copy of that with the agency to put in your file. So make sure you don't give them your original. Make sure you keep a copy of it. Um, Going back also on the, uh, the polygraph exam or any part of the testing process, one really good piece of advice, if you have a warrant, don't go. Or go because they're going to find that warrant and you're just going to go to jail. That's happened in some of the processes that I went through. Oral board, somebody's come in, told us in our ear, hey, this guy's got a warrant, no problem. As soon as he walked out of the interview process, we arrested him and he ended up going to jail. So if you got a warrant, you know, 
misdemeanor felony don't matter don't apply um so, yeah, that's that's funny. And actually, in episode number three, I discuss uh, police agency ride-alongs, and that exactly happened to me. They stuck me with a ride-along, uh, and uh, I picked up his paperwork from the watch commander's office, and his uh, local record check was not attached to it. And I was like, ah, well, you know, I need to go over to the records counter. So I scoot over to the records counter, fill out a request, and this guy's got a traffic warrant. So, you know, he, he shows up, and I'm like, you can't ride with me to— today in the front seat you're gonna have to ride with me in the back seat so i i didn't cuff him um we went over to traffic court and you know he paid his bail and i and i said hey listen you know apply again but uh because now we know you're clear of warrants but you're not riding with me tonight so right good good advice <laughs> yes no whether you have a warrant or not right and, and the thing is too one thing that's going to come up especially with the highway patrol and I'm not sure if it's the same with city and uh, county agencies, is they're going to look at your driving record as well. So if you got a history of speeding, you might have a problem getting on with the department. So you get one or two speeding tickets, not a big problem. Even a misdemeanor here and there, maybe shoplifting as a kid, usually it's not a problem. When things start turning into felonies or you're doing something that, if you were caught, could have been considered a felony, such as the individual that, told me that he was buying bags of marijuana and then selling smaller bags of marijuana to other kids as a felony that could be considered a felony in the state of Arizona. So that really takes him out of the process. For the military guys, really the DD-214 is the most inter- is, is the most important part. It's also important to know and remember who your last commander is, your last com- company commander, maybe a platoon leader and your first sergeant. But we also know as a background investigation, those things change at any time. Usually commanders change uh, a command once a year. A first sergeant might retire before a background investigator can get a hold of them. So it's really important to have, if you can find anybody that you're in the military with, that you're still friends with, that have a good phone number, contact information for a background investigator to get a hold of to see how you performed in the military. It's also good to have any kind of awards that you've been given, good conduct medals, Army accommodation medals, or whatever branch you're in. If you have those records, you can present those too. That gives a background investigator, hey, this is a pretty good idea. This guy did did pretty well. I became a sergeant within three years in the infantry. That's usually a, 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 about par for the standard, but the military or the uh, my background investigators also knew that I was going up the chain of command. Um, I was actually a nightmare for my background investigator when I got hired because I had about 15 different jobs that I did from the time I was in high school to the time I became a police officer. That includes four years in the military. And then after I got out of the military, there's a seven year period that I had where I worked with multiple agency or multiple uh airlines I did mm-hmm. side jobs with other companies and you had to list all those on your background check and they did they went to every single employer that i worked for and asked them questions about me about my character about my work ethics so it's really important that when you start filling out the process you know you make sure you you have all that information ready it, it makes it much quicker for the background investigator so perhaps keep copies of your evaluations when you're in the military Correct. That would help. That would definitely help to show, you know, if they can't get a hold of your first sergeant or a platoon mm-hmm. sergeant or your company commander, those evaluations, if you can get a copy of them, that really helps them understand uh, your your character and your work ethics. So it's easier when you get out of the military and go directly into to police work because the background investigator will be able to reach out to, you know, your, uh, your leadership uh, much easily because the chances are they're in. But you leave right. five years later, who knows where those people are you right. know, in the world or whether they're even in the service anymore or whether you can get recent contact information. It is important for you to have a stable work history um, because your personal history statement is going to ask for every job that you've worked at for your last 10 years. So if you separate and have a few jobs in between applying for the police department, you're going to have to put those on the application. You know, the agency wants to make sure that you can stay continuously employed. If you have a period of unemployment, yeah, we get it. But 
a gap in your employment could be a red flag that needs to be right. investigated. So, you know, and they're going to ask, they're going to ask what you did during that period, you know? So another important thing is too, is your finances, you know, they're going to dig into your finances as well. You know, what were you doing during that two year period? How are you paying your rent or how are you paying your mortgage? Because they don't want somebody coming into law enforcement thinking, you know, this guy's could possibly turn into a, a bad police officer. And they've had it. I mean, we've had an individual at my department that was taking leave. And during taking leave, he was running drugs from Mexico to, to somewhere up in the mid Midwest. And he was carrying his badge to show, hey, you know, I'm a police officer. This is undercover. I'm doing it for my department. <laughs> Only for them to call my department and say, no, he's not. He's, he's on leave. And he lost his career. He's in jail. And, and so... They'll look at your finances as well, especially if you're going to get into specialized units and anything to do with money handling. They want to make sure, you know, you can handle your finances. You haven't filed for bankruptcy, you know, one, two or three times or fallen behind on your house. You lost your house to foreclosure. You know, all that's going to be looked at. Well, the good news for anybody that has issues with uh their their credit or are uncertain of what their credit report looks like, every one of the re- uh, re- credit recording bureaus allow you to get a copy of their report for yourself for free by going to any of the the websites and filling out information and you absolutely should do that before you apply you want to know yes. what the red fl- flags are there could be charges on there that uh, don't belong to you or you could have been reported as um, paying late and that's not necessarily the case so right. I encourage everybody, and, and as we know, um, and even in the military, you know, most everything's being provided for you, and you know, you have this extra cash. So what do you do? You go down to the, the military credit union, you get a car loan, and you get yourself that that car that you wanted for so right. long. Well, you still have to pay for that. So you know, hopefully it's a payroll deduction. But I've seen many uh, military uh, personnel start having credit issues while they were in. And so you need to address that immediately and, you know, don't overextend yourself. And, right. uh, but if, uh, before you apply, run your credit check because the agency is going to, going to run it and you're going to have to address that. That will get you in trouble. Your conduct and how, um, will kill you in the selection process, your credit, your traffic record and dishonesty. Those are the, the big ones that are going to get you. Right. And if you do have an issue with your credit, be honest with the recruiter. That's that's the I can't stress it enough. That's the most important thing you can do is to be honest, be upfront and honest with them. If, if you missed a few payments on your house, if you missed a few payments on your car, explain it to the recruiter why that happened. And they're going to work with you. They're going to help you. They don't want to find it out on your own. And you lied about it. Be upfront with it. Tell them what happened. And. I feel you're going to be fine. You'd be able to continue to go through the process. Great. Well, do you have any last words of wisdom for our audience before we wrap this up, Ken? Sure. Law enforcement is, I never even thought about becoming a police officer until I met my friend in the army reserves. Not once did it ever cross my mind. I was actually a private pilot and I was going to be working on my commercial license. It is the absolute best job I could have ever asked for. Yeah, I, I was a highway patrol officer. I was a undercover with a gang unit doing undercover work with the uh, outlaw motorcycle gangs, 15 years with the bomb squad, and then also a breacher for the SWAT team. I mean, I can sit in my rocking chair in 10 years and think back of the explosive breaches that I've done, of the hostage rescue um, warrants that I've served and and it's absolutely the best uh, career I can I can ever have asked for. And, and to this day, and the first person I thanked when I retired was Sergeant Bob Stell and telling him, thank you so much for turning me on to the Department of Public Safety. It's, it's the best career I could have asked for. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now at 50careers.com. So I could tell fellow veterans, look, if you're looking for a job, you're not going to get rich off of it. But it is absolutely fulfilling when you can pull a 10-year-old off of a rooftop that's threatening to jump or rescue somebody out of a car crash um, before it catches on fire. It's, it's, that's more than money can pay for. It's an excellent career. 
any questions you have, feel free to reach out to Tony. Feel free to reach out to me at 50careers.com. It's the best. I agree with you 100%. That's why I also provide free consultation services. I tell all you vets out there, we need you in law enforcement. And law enforcement gives you the opportunity to continue with your legacy of duty, honor, and valor. And when you finish your career, you will be able to honestly look back on your life and you've done something of substance. Yeah, so, and don't let the news, don't let the news, you know, dissuade you from becoming a police officer. Everybody's screaming about defund the police, defund the police. Don't listen to that. Don't worry about that. Agencies from coast to coast are struggling to find well-qualified individuals. And for me personally, I think those best are from military. If you're looking for a job, also do research into the agency. But a lot of the times, you know, look at that municipality as if you're married, you know, and there's going to be jobs for your spouse as well. So, you know, give it a shot. It's, it's a great career. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you, Ken, for joining us today. Remind everybody you can go to 50 careers.com for information about the services that Ken offers. And also you can always go to lawenforcementguru.com for the latest tips, tactics, and resources available there. So until next time, be safe. Now that you've finished this episode of The Law Enforcement Guru, it's time to take your education even further by visiting our webpage for valuable resources like show notes on today's episode, videos, blogs, and downloadable content to make you even more marketable long before you enter the interview. You can find all this and more on lawenforcementguru.com. Oh, 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 oh,